station, The Nigel Farage Show. Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, of course, it was building up to be a very big Brexit week. We were expecting big votes on the 14th Thursday, Valentine's votes, Valentine's Day massacres being talked about. But the Prime Minister was back today before the House of Commons, and now she's pleading for more time. On Thursday, as I promised in the House last month, we will bring forward an amendable motion. This will seek to reaffirm the support of the House for the amended motion from the 29th of January, namely to support the government in seeking changes to the backstop and to recognise that negotiations are ongoing. Having secured an agreement with the European Union for further talks, we now need some time to complete that process. When we, when we achieve the progress we need, we will bring forward another meaningful vote. But if the government... But if the government has not secured a majority in this House in favour of a withdrawal agreement and a political declaration, then the government will on Tuesday the 26th of February make a statement and table an amendable motion relating to the statement, and the Minister will move that motion on Wednesday the 27th of February, thereby enabling the House to vote on it and on any amendments to it on that day. So she's pleading with the House and saying, look, give me another couple of weeks. I've won a great victory. They've agreed to go on speaking to me. Um, but, you know, if we can't get anything that suits the House of Commons, then on the 27th of February, you will be able to put forward and vote on other ideas, such as the idea for a second referendum or so-called people's vote, or, of course, perhaps even an extension. Uh, and it's not absolutely impossible that the Prime Minister herself could get to the end of February and say, we need more time, we need to extend Article 50. But her priority, of course, is to get this deal through. Uh, now, Jeremy Corbyn, in response, was not happy with her request at all. Mr Speaker, our country is facing the biggest crisis in a generation, and yet the Prime Minister continues to recklessly run down the clock. We were promised there would be a deal last October. It didn't happen. We were promised a meaningful vote on a deal in December. It didn't happen. We were told to prepare for a further meaningful vote this week after the Prime Minister again promised to secure significant and legally binding changes to the backstop, and that hasn't happened. Now the Prime Minister comes before the House with more excuses and more delays. In truth, Mr Speaker, it appears the Prime Minister has just one real tactic, to run down the clock, hoping members of this House are blackmailed into supporting a deeply flawed deal. Well, it's a bit difficult to disagree, really, with Jeremy Corbyn. That is what she's doing. She is running down the clock, and she's going to say, ultimately, isn't she, at the end, look, I've got these concessions. Uh, vote for this. If you don't, you won't be honouring Brexit. If you don't vote for this, uh, we'll probably have to extend the date, and it'll be your fault, not my fault. There are some that think that maybe she's actually secretly beginning to favour a withdrawal on WTO terms. I still don't quite believe it, but what I do know is behind the scenes a lot of work's going on. So all things are possible. But do you think that Mrs May deserves more time to renegotiate? Or do you think, hang on, she's had nearly two years at this. This is ridiculous. Call 0345 6060 973. Or maybe you think, hey, what's another couple of weeks after two years anyway? And maybe she will win some decent concessions, text to 84850, or maybe you think the whole thing now is a complete waste of time. It's perfectly clear the EU are not going to budge. About time Mrs May did something more radical, in which case tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC, and of course Facebookers, you can comment there too. Uh, yeah, I mean, she desperately wants to get this deal through, but she knows with the backstop as it is, that simply isn't going to happen. Uh, Boris Johnson tried today to put her on the spot and he said, look, you know, he's prepared to accept a time limit on the backstop, but that date has to be ahead, substantially ahead of the next general election in 2022. Would Brussels be prepared to do that? I just don't know. I think the answer and everyone thinks, well, 
in this game of chicken that's going on, where they're sort of looking at each other and saying, well, who's going to blink first? A lot of people think the EU are going to make big concessions. I think, to be honest with you, they're only going to make very, very small ones. I begin to wonder whether Yanis Varoufakis, who, if you remember, was the Greek finance minister, who said at the start of this, he said, I, as a Greek government minister, tried to negotiate with the European Commission. It was a waste of time. They were intent on bullying and breaking down Greece. And he said Britain should just have walked, given we would voted for Brexit. Luke is calling from Bristol. Good evening, Luke. Uh, good evening, Nigel. So does Mrs uh, May deserve another fortnight? Well, I think um, the whole Brexit issue... It's a little bit one of those, uh, you can't see the wood for trees. So I think it's all right to step back just for a moment and think, what is the role of Parliament in all this? Because in my mind, in a democracy, Parliament's there to provide a bit of oversight to the government. They're there uh, to... Uh, to, be, to be a check on the executive, yeah? Yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it. So we come down to the question, really, what does leave mean? People say leave means leave, but... Mm -hmm, um, I do. Some people say leave means WTO. Some people say leave means Theresa May's deal. There are there's Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn's we say, proposal out there as well. So given this kind of ambiguity, I feel it's Parliament's right to say, OK, which path do we choose? And so rather than just saying, um, running, well, rather than just running down the clock and saying, right, time's up, we're leaving. I think Parliament must make an affirmative vote to say, yes, WTO is what we want. But what if Parliament doesn't do that, Luke? If Parliament doesn't do that, then I still think it is doing its democratic right as providing that kind of oversight to the government, saying you can't just have any old Brexit you like. So imagine, um, for example, Theresa May said to Brussels, I want to leave in name only. But for other purposes, what, what, we shall what, remain. Think, that would be terrible, I wouldn't think, it? I think that's what she has done, Luke, isn't it, with this withdrawal agreement? Well, <laughs> I mean, you well, know. That's, a fair, that's a fair point. Um, <laughs> my, my point I mean, look, 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 I do understand the point you're making about, you know, the role of the executive and of parliament and all the rest of it. But I would argue very strongly that it was pretty clear from all the leading players in the referendum, from both sides of the argument, that a vote to leave meant we were leaving the single market and customs union, and that those things should not be up for negotiation. Hmm. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a valid standpoint, and obviously a lot of people have said that. Mm. There are a lot of people, however, who obviously disagree with you. And when we have these disagreements, that's what Parliament's job is, in my mind. They're there to represent people. So until Parliament gives the thumbs up saying, yes, WTO, or yes, Theresa May's deal, then I think it's, should we say, undemocratic to say, time up, let's leave. Well, Luke, all I would say to you is this, that you're quite right, normally it is their job, uh, you know, to be there as elected representatives, not delegates, and I accept that, I understand that. However, what is different about this, Luke, is this particular decision was subcontracted back out to us. Uh, Luke, let me ask you just very quickly, where do you think this will all end? I think, well, I was in favour of the first referendum because for as long as I've been able to vote, this issue of Brexit has always been around. So I was quite in favour of the referendum coming out, getting those issues out. But I'm also in favour that for the last two years, Parliament has been in deadlock, and that can only be broken ultimately by putting it back to the people. So, so we vote leave again. So we vote leave again. And what does that mean? Ah. Uh, now, again, I'm kind of with the Liberal Democrats, and they said, <laughs> oh, I'm very sorry about that. Yes, um, they said, we have chosen to leave, I'm fine with that, but we haven't chosen the destination, whether it's a deal or no deal or whatever. So I think a, a deal on the final terms is what we need. So I think World Trade Organization absolutely has to be there. Um, so a referendum, a so a there. referendum, Luke, a referendum, Luke, on how we leave if Parliament can't sort it out. Oh, absolutely. OK, all right. No, Luke, thank you. You've made your point. Uh, Mahesh is a new caller from Harrow. Good evening to you. Hey, good evening to you, Nigel. I'm so thrilled to talk to you. I'm a big fan of yours. I'm, a, I'm by the way, Belgian national. Moved to the UK. Uh, right, four, OK. Four, 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 five years. I come from Brussels. So I'm an Indian, lived in Brussels for a long time. So yep. uh, as I, I'm a big um, ear skeptic. <laughs> I, 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 right. wish I, could have vote, I wish I could have voted as a referendum to leave. 
uh, you know, I, I hate as much process as you do because I lived there 10 years. And yeah, well, you know I, what it's like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ex ex so, <laughs> exactly. I, I, I had loads of friends working in the EU. I know how much, uh, you know, how much they make and, you know, the fast salaries. And, you know, when I look at, I used to work in a private company. I used to be like 52% that. And, you know, they used to get a much lesser gross income, gross income than me and, you know, pay like peanut tax, I think community tax or something like that, I don't know. Well, that's so, right. I mean, you would have been paying, You would, if you were working in Brussels, you might have been paying 50% with tax and, and national it, insurances. Exactly. And, if you, and if you work for the European Commission, your top rate tax is 16%. So there's great resentment oh, in Brussels about yeah. that. Mahesh, you know, you've obviously, you're a keen Eurosceptic, you've watched our Prime Minister, uh, you know, she is running down the clock, isn't she? Exactly. I think that's what she's, I mean, secretly, secretly, which you don't believe, but I think secretly, secretly, probably it's, she wants to make it a no deal for us, which would be fantastic. Oh. I, I, oh. I, 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 I think they should have started. I mean, we should have had a, a leave prime minister to start with, which we didn't have, unfortunately. And, and more, more than people talking about a Brexit prime minister, we should be talking about a believer prime minister. I think Britain should believe in itself. I think I, oh, came, to this country, I came to this country four and a half years ago. I call it my home now. And, and this country has given whatever I have got. I mean, I got a job here, so I've been paying taxes. I have my own company now. I'm freelancer now, so I'm paying taxes as well. So I, I think this country should be open to immigrants, but only people who can come and contribute and assimilate well in the society. I think that's, that's how the, I think that's the direction we, and that's the reason why people voted leave in big numbers, to be very honest. And, and I can tell we should have started with the premise of no deal. We should have just told them on the day of Article 50 that, you know what? Guys, we are leaving on whatever well, you, date that is. Yeah, two yeah, years. You can't. Uh, you, you can't know, negotiate with these people. Mahesh, do you? I mean, just deep down, do you somewhere think that this prime minister could possibly, if she wants to deliver Brexit, go for a WTO deal? Uh, I think she should have started on WTO. I mean, when she went last week. I mean, last weekend. <laughs> she, yeah. she, I mean, how, how much time can we waste on it? I mean, what could she do it, Mahesh? Could could she surprise us all at the, at the very last minute? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know, because, you know, I read a lot of stuff you know around... What? You know what, Mahesh, I don't know either, but if she does, I'll recommend her statue goes up in Trafalgar Square. Mahesh, great to talk to you. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show at 6.15, and time for the news headlines with Lisa Aziz. We see Mrs May says to Parliament, give me another two weeks, and I promise you, by the end of the month, you'll be able to have meaningful votes, put down amendments and all the rest of it. But, you see, I've now found out why. Because, actually, she's very optimistic. She has found a secret weapon, indeed. David Liddington, her deputy, was over in Brussels on Monday night having dinner with this individual. And this is the man that Mrs May thinks can be an influencer to break the deadlock. Who is it? Well, it's somebody about whom I said this in 2010. You have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. And the question that I want to ask, the question that I want to ask, that we're all going to ask, is who are you? I'd never heard of you. Nobody in Europe had ever heard of you. I would like to ask you, President, who voted for you? He's back. Herman Van Rompuy. I thought he'd retired, got away to write his haikus. I thought we'd never, ever see him again. But no, Mrs May thinks Herman Van Rompuy is the man who can break the deadlock. I don't think she's necessarily right. But hey, who's to say? But she is asking for another two weeks. Corbyn accuses her of running down the clock. Corbyn accuses her, basically, of pushing us into a position where she blackmails MPs into voting for her deal. Does she deserve another two weeks? Mark is a new caller from Glasgow. Good evening, Mark. Hello. So, does she deserve more time, Mark? No, she doesn't. Okay. Uh, vote leave. I vote leave. Uh, I'm actually originally from the Bumpton Buchan area up in like the northeast of Scotland. Yep. And basically what she's trying to do is keep us at half in, half I uh, half in, half out, which is not what none of us voted for. Well I, I believe and we should believe in a clean break. So is it time then, Mark, that the Prime Minister said, look, you've mucked us about for too long. I do admit I've made some mistakes, but actually folks, we will be leaving on March the twenty ninth at 11 p.m. UK time, and we'll do it uh, on WTO terms. We'll go to the WTO. We'll apply under Article 24 of the GATT Treaty so we can carry on 
with no tariffs, with no quotas for at least two years while we sort things out. Isn't that the right thing, Mark, for her now to do? Oh, that's, that's what I've, so I actually recently learned about the WTO uh, scenario, and I'd, I'd rather go with that than paying the EU billions of pounds. And it's going to have all the bureaucracy on top. Obviously, yourself, you're an MEP, MEP yourself. Uh, I just think there's too much there's a government in this country. There's obviously, like in Scotland, you've got MSPs, you've got MPs in London, and then you've obviously got councillors and you've MEPs. There's just too much kind of. No one knows layer what's after happened layer in the country, after right? layer. Yeah, no, no, no yeah. I get that. But Mark, she she shows no great signs of doing this. Uh, I mean, wh- where do you think? Not not what do you want, but where do you think this is all going to end up? Well, I personally see we're going to, the scenario could be but a half in half out, which the people it obviously vote. I include myself and yourself. It voted for leave. It's not going to be our. Uh, uh, votes respected at the end of it. Well, Mark, through. if her deal, yeah, if her deal goes through, we will be half in, half out, and the battle will go on for year after year after year. Mark, thank you for your passion. Lee is a new caller from South End. Good evening. Hello, Nigel. How are you? I am fine. So, Mrs. May's going to sort the whole thing out, Lee. In the next couple of weeks, what are we worrying about? Everything, absolutely everything. <clears throat> I don't think she should ever, ever have been the person to lead us out of Bre- uh, lead us through Brexit. I believe it should have been a Brexiteer, someone that was passionate about it. Um, she is a Remainer, as we all know, mm-hmm. and I think she's going to deliver a Brexit in name only if it, if it's her her deal. And I think at the end it will either be her deal or no deal. And I hope it's no deal. Okay, okay, Lee, and you and you think that's possible, yeah? Um, I hope so. Having, as I said to your um, researcher, having watched the last three weeks of Inside the EU, um, mm-hmm. which has given a great insight as to how stubborn they are, um, and I don't think they're going to budge. I just do not think they're going to budge um, on this backstop. Um, I think she's in cloud cuckoo land. Um, you know, if she thinks she's going to get it through, I don't think she will do. Um, and I, I, as I say, I'd be happy with no deal. Well, Lee, you never know. I tell you what, one thing for certain, Lee, anything actually is possible. Thank you. Chris says, you see, the EU were never going to give us a good deal. They want to punish us and warn other countries not to try and escape their clutches. So renegotiation is a waste of time. But it does get us nearer to Independence Day. Chris, I have been getting this from Eurosceptics for the last couple of days. I said, well, actually, do you know what? You know, time is running out for all of this. And if she wants to be the Prime Minister that goes down in history of having stood up and said she would deliver us Brexit, she might be left at the last minute with no other option than a WTO and go for Article 24. VJ is calling from West Drayton, a new caller. Good evening. Hello, Nigel. How are you? I'm well. Welcome to the show. So, she wants more time. Does she deserve it? She absolutely doesn't deserve it. And to make things worse, um, even if there is a snap election tomorrow, and let's say Jeremy Corbyn gets elected the following day, I don't mm-hmm. think he's going to solve the problem as well. And I don't think he would deserve the two weeks as well. Um, I feel the whole approach to Brexit has been wrong from day one, from, from when uh-huh. the voting happened. Um, uh, if, if it were me, I mean, if it were me, I would have approached it as uh, as per the people's vote. You know, people voted to leave. So I'd rather plan to leave. And then if, if, if there is a deal which comes along from the EU, then I'd rather take it. Uh, if you see what conservatives have been doing, is um, basically they've been telling the people that, you know, a deal is coming, a deal is coming, and we're almost through the two-and-a-half-year-old period, and still there's nothing. So what I'm most worried about is both the parties inclusive nobody is talking about the no deal scenario so when i when i voted leave i signed up for the economic impact i signed up for not having the uh, most important commodities in in britain after the no deal uh, uh, exit so what <laughs> i'm most worried about is no party or no part no politician is talking about what are what is the economic impact what commodities we won't get 
and um, you know, are but we VJ, beginning to control? VJ, uh, yeah. VJ, VJ, you know, when you hear the president of the Port of Calais saying there will be no delays at all, you know, this stuff's going to come in anyway. You know, I mean, frankly, the idea there'll be shortages of drugs or food, I mean, it's just that's just project fear. BJ, given that you've had enough of this prime minister, what do you think should happen now? I think we should just leave. We should just leave. Just leave. Uh, and, 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 if, and if the current government cannot deliver um, uh, a no-deal exit, then I think they should they should move on. And you know, there should be an election, and people should be given the opportunity to vote. Okay. All right, BJ. I thank you. Uh, Paolo says, I think Theresa May may well be doing a fantastic job and fooling us all. She's constantly said Brexit will be delivered, so she may be trying to pretend to reopen the so-called deal, whereas in fact she may have no intention at all. Paolo, maybe she is going for no deal. I just don't know. John doesn't like Corbyn, but I do think he's put his finger on it. She's running it down to the wire to frighten everyone to vote for her deal instead of no deal. So fed up with this. Help! You know, but John, I, I, I agree with you. I do think Corbyn's analysis to date was actually right. And Tina, going crackers here, no extension, exclamation mark. Nearly three years wasted, thanks to the EU setting the timetable. Why did she agree to the timetable they set? Uh, Tina, I, I, you know, uh, one thing I do know is uh, that if we want an extension, the EU will, of course, give it to her because they can then say to their electorates at the end of May, look, don't be stupid like the Brits. You can't leave this club. Better to be a part of it and try and reform from within. She's had two years, Lindsay says. She should not have invoked Article 50 without a scooby-doo of what she was going to do. Why should she now be given an extension to carry on doing what she has been doing, which is really not very much? Come on, somebody out there must tell me. Somebody, come on, please, 03456060973, tell me Mrs May does deserve the extra fortnight. Tell me she's doing a fantastic job leading the nation through Brexit. You're listening to the Nigel Farage Show. It's Slusvin LBC. It is now 6.30 in time for the news. Willisa Aziz. Well, the political weather keeps on changing in our country and in many ways in a direction that I rather like because a lot of the things that I've been talking about for years are beginning to be said by other people. And today, blow me, John Sargent, the former BBC and ITN and, of course, Strictly Come Dancing uh, contestant, John Sargent said today, in my years as a political correspondent with both the BBC and ITV, I was fully aware of the immigration taboo. He said, as with all serious political issues, brushing it under the carpet can lead to widespread misunderstandings that we fail to address at our peril. John Sargent, fantastic, you're right, and there has been a complete taboo almost from around about the turn of the century on this, and anyone that dared to talk about the escalating numbers was immediately accused of something unpleasant, rather than us having a proper grown-up debate. John Sargent said it, and he's right. But even more remarkably, now, one of my key targets on this show has been the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, he of Project Fear. And I've said again and again, surely... He ought to be fairly neutral in this debate. Well, today in a speech to the Financial Times, he said, in many respects, Brexit is the first test of a new global order and could prove the acid test of whether a way can be found to broaden the benefits of openness while enhancing democratic accountability. He said Brexit can lead to a new form of international cooperation and cross-border commerce built on a better balance of local and supranational authorities. He goes on to talk about freer trade in services. He goes on to talk about benefits for small and medium-sized companies. Mark Carney is saying Brexit could be really good for the UK. I don't know what they put in his tea this morning, but clearly it's working. The political weather is changing. Brexit, I think many are now beginning to accept that Brexit, how or when, is a separate question, but many are beginning to accept that Brexit is an inevitability. Back to the Prime Minister, back to the extra couple of weeks that she wants. Does she actually deserve it? Is there some master plan that I haven't seen as yet? Catherine from Uckfield is a new caller. Good evening, Hi. Catherine. Hi, Hi welcome. So, what do you think about Mrs May begging for, for two more weeks? No, absolutely not. Um, I was actually a Remain voter in 2016, and uh -huh. I think the last two years have told us everything that we, we need to know. And I spend most of my life going over to Brussels and Paris to negotiate with local authorities and 
this is just not untypical. So what I would say is um, I think where we're going wrong is your speech to the European Parliament two weeks ago, which I think was January the 30th. I was in Paris at that time, and it was interesting how that was being reported. But also you should look at Juncker and Barnier's faces. I I I know. There's... I, I, <laughs> they are scared, and I, I yep. really, really don't understand why this country seems to think the EU should dominate us. I just really don't understand it. So, Can I ask, Catherine, I mean, given what you've just said, and by the way, yep. weren't the faces, weren't the faces of Juncker and Barnier that day really fascinating? They were very scared of what I was saying. They and are. I was actually, uh, and I was actually being very constructive in what I said about the use of, of Article 24 of the GATT Treaty and a sensible grown-up way of resolving this. But, Catherine, given what you've just said to me, yeah. why, did you, why did you vote Remain back in sixteen? Because I didn't feel qualified to make that decision because what David Cameron did is he said, you vote to stay or go, so remain or leave. So people Mm -hmm. made the vote on that basis. It wasn't about if you vote to leave, it's going to be on WTO terms, it's going to be in something else terms. It didn't say that. It didn't talk about a deal. And I think that's why everybody's confused and I think there's some people that are really misinformed but what I would say is your speech at the European Parliament um, has really made them think because if you go on Twitter, Michel Barnier Juncker, the European Commission are now sending out stuff on Twitter about how this withdrawal deal is a great deal for Britain so I Mm. think something you said Mm. has actually changed the game and that's not being reported by the media uh, well, Catherine, I was amazed. That particular speech, the last time I looked, had 7.3 million views on YouTube. I'm not surprised. Without a, I'm, I'm without not a, surprised by that. And I think, I don't know why you were not part of the negotiations. I mean, for Theresa well, May, I wanted to be. I'm a Tory supporter, but the thing I'd say about the Tories is it does, nobody was able, going to be able to negotiate a poison chalice. And that's essentially what this is. No, I, well, Catherine, you know, unless you go into these negotiations prepared to walk away on a no-deal basis, you're not going to get anywhere with these people, and she never looks serious. Catherine, thank you for what you had to say. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, and interestingly, I was in Paris last Thursday. I broadcast from Paris last Thursday evening, and I was there with the business community at lunchtime. And actually, what I did say that day here has made some impact. The thought that the UK could leave, and we've got at least two years after we've left, with the WTO acting as an honest broker, I think it is, to me, the constructive way forward. Paul says, I'm in business, and everyone I speak to wants to simply get on with it. Deal or no deal, we just want to be out at the end of March. We must end this constant uncertainty. Mrs May cannot ignore what we will demand. And Paul, you know, I do genuinely think that extension of Article 50 would be the worst of all all worlds. We finish up contesting more European elections. It's not what we need. Tom from Newbury is a new caller. Hi, Tom. Hi. Hi, Nigel. Good, good evening. Good evening. Welcome. So, you know, she's had nearly two years since Article 50 was triggered and she wants another fortnight. Maybe another fortnight doesn't really matter, Tom. I, I mean, I think uh, Parliament has finally well, ha- have given her a clear remit in terms of addressing the, uh, the the backstop, and um, you know, she owes it to the country to to negotiate, uh, you know, uh, right up to the um, to the final hour to uh, try and get a deal done. Um, I think there is priority to the area that needs to be addressed, um, as much as the try and try and um, obfuscate that. Um, so so yeah, um, you know, take you know, try and negotiate, get the deal done, but. Um, there needs to be an end, end point um, with all. Well, it does, Tom, because 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 you know we can play this we can play this game. She can play this game against Barnier of sort of waiting to see who blinks first. But if a sub, if, a, if a real change to the backstop was to come, but come too late, would there be time in Westminster? Would there be time here in Strasbourg to get it through? Or would, in the end, this game mean we'd have to extend Article Fifty? I, I, Tom, I just don't know. But can you see? If this goes to the wire, can you see the European Union maybe making a serious concession? Uh, well, time will tell. 
time will tell. It's, it, you know, it, it, it's so hard to uh, predict this. Nigel, I've got one question for you, if I may. Um, Go on. It's just Go around on. Uh, Corbyn's proposal. Uh, and I, I just haven't really seen any, any solid reporting on, on, on Corbyn's proposal. Uh, and I suppose my question is, how different is Corbyn's proposal to staying in the EU? Well, uh, Corbyn's proposal, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Corbyn's proposal is Brexit in name only. It's just a rather worse form of it than Theresa May's withdrawal agreement. But, the, but, but, uh, you know, the one thing, uh, the one thing that Corbyn's proposal by keeping us in a permanent customs union would do, and which he sees a benefit, is it obviates the need for uh, the Irish backstop. So that 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 that's what Corbyn's doing. My view, Tom, is that Corbyn is being as Eurosceptic as he dare given that he's leading a Labour Party, most of whom's MPs are, you know, pretty remain, many of whom uh, still want to go for the second referendum option. So that's what that, that's what Corbyn's doing. Uh, but, it, you know, it is not a true form of Brexit. And if we're stuck inside a customs union, we're not free to make our own trade deals around the world. We're not going to be, Tom, a really independent country. OK, OK. Well, thank you, right. Nigel. Lovely. Thank you very much. And if you call, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's 6.45 and time for the news headlines with Lisa Aziz. Mrs May wants a couple more weeks. It looks like the really big, crucial, vital votes are going to happen on the 27th of February and not on the 14th of February. Meanwhile, I have to comment on George Soros. George Soros, a billionaire, massively successful investor over the course of the last 50 years and, of course, the big backer uh, of the people's vote pro-referendum campaigns in our country and indeed he's the head of an organization called open society who are the best funded political campaign the world has ever seen uh, and of course i've been very much in direct opposition uh, to soros for a very very long time well today he's written a piece for a business website called market watch in which he says that pro-europe voters need to wake up before the continent sleepwalks into oblivion. He says the people of Europe need to do this before it's too late. If they don't, the European Union will go the way of the Soviet Union in 1991. Neither our leaders or ordinary citizens seem to understand we're experiencing a revolutionary moment and that the range of possibilities is very broad and the eventual outcome is thus highly uncertain. So if we don't all go out and vote in the European elections across Europe for pro-EU parties, the EU will disappear like the Soviet Union did. Well, Mr Soros, good, I hope it does. And I can't believe that George Soros seems to be saying here that the breakup of the Soviet Union was a bad thing. Clearly this man believes in big, undemocratic, centralised government. I find those words truly astonishing. And this is not an off-the-cuff remark. This has actually been written on a business website. Soros is completely wrong. By the way, I'm not saying the European Union is like the Soviet Union, but there are a few similarities, I've got to tell you. On Facebook, Chris says to me, Mrs May does not deserve another two weeks, but realistically she needs it. It's not what she wants, it's what we told her to do. If she opposes Brexit, then she's biting the hand that feeds her, just like the EU are doing to the UK. Well, Chris, yeah, and you know, there's no question that, uh, and, and Catherine commented before, one of the reasons why Juncker and Barnier look so unhappy at the end of January with what, I, with what I was saying here is because I was saying, look, if we leave on WTO terms, go for 24, Article 24 of the GATT Treaty, you don't get your 39 billion. And that, I think, upset them more than anything, because us going and not paying that money would leave a huge hole. Does Mrs May deserve another fortnight, or is it time we changed tack? Michael is a new caller from Manchester. Good evening, Michael. Hi, good evening, Michael. Good to speak to you, Nigel. Unlike um, most of your callers, I, I think she does deserve another two weeks. And I think okay. she's cleverly, but not, not, not cynically, cleverly winding down the clock and going to be presenting Parliament with a binary choice between her deal and no deal. And she's doing that in a clever way. So, she, for example, Bill Cash today tried to get her to answer a straight question, will we leave on, 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 on no deal if, if we don't get through a deal? And she, wasn't, she, didn't, she didn't fall for it. She didn't, she didn't say yes, because that would upset all the people who, who want to have no deal taken off the table. And of course you can't take no deal off the table because then you're cutting off your negotiating hand. So she's very cleverly playing this um, in, in such a way. And, and, I, and, and, and if we do end up leaving with no deal, she'll be, all, she'll be able to say, well, 
don't blame me. I kept pushing for my deal. And that's why she, today she kept saying my deal is the only deal. And she's doing that so that if we eventually leave with no deal, she, no, no, nobody can blame her. And, and I wonder if you agree with me on this, Nigel. A lot of people are saying that the EU at the 11th hour will will change tactics and throw us something which, which, which will surprise everybody and give us a, 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 a deal which we want. But I feel that the EU, under no circumstances, wants Brexit to be a success. However much it will damage them, and it will damage them, there's nothing that will damage them more than a successful Brexit. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, that would be a, a complete catastrophe for them. I do actually rather agree with your analysis that as she runs down the clock, um, she does. And, and, and Corbyn wasn't completely wrong, you know, with his approach to this either. But as she runs down that clock, you know, it, it, it is almost putting MPs up against a wall, isn't it? And saying, look, you know, if you don't go for my deal and they still hate her deal, um, we're going to get a no deal Brexit. Uh, Michael, doesn't it all really say to you that ultimately... Ultimately, extension becomes more and more likely. Well, Jacob V. Smog said that if we've got a deal in, 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 you know, in reach, and it's just a question of dotting the T's and, and, and et cetera, then yes, n nobody's, nobody's averse to a few weeks extension if it's just a matter of getting the legislation through. It's, it's, it's the extension with not knowing then what that, that people are Absol averse Well, to. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just an extension without anything really having been agreed, uh, not just because we're going to tidy up, uh, could lead to further extensions. Michael, I, I, I do understand your analysis. Um, do I think at the in the last minute there's going to be some massive concession like dropping the backstop? No, I don't. Um, and I think if that was to happen, uh, the message would be, well, Ireland were very useful to us as a bargaining chip, but in the end, you know what? We just dropped them. And I, I do think if that message was to get out, they'd be in even more trouble. So, you know, we may get some legalese, a codicil that's attached uh, to it. But no, I do not see a massive concession. Michael, good analysis. Thank you. Mary lives in Howden and is a new caller. Good evening, Mary. Oh, good evening. Um, no, I don't think she should have any more time. It's just prolonging the agony, isn't it? I, I it think is agony, it's time, isn't it? I think it's time for Mrs. Chamberlain i.e. Mrs. May, to leave the floor and for Churchill, <laughs> like in 1940. I mean, it, it took the threat of invasion before the British establishment, but somebody who could actually stand up to the Germans in, in um, power, you know. I mean, poor Well, that's Churchill, true, Mary. That's true, Mary. And, 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 and even then, even when Churchill did take over on the 10th of May 1940, there were still many deeply reluctant about him taking that position. Um, exactly. I mean, the BBC uh, didn't allow Churchill any voice on the radio for three years before 1940. Uh, um, I, think it was a, I, I, I think it was 18 months, Mary, but your point is well made. No, absolutely. In fact, in fact it's, it's, all rather, it's all rather similar today, isn't it, really? But we've always had the, the establishment of being these appeasers and traitors, really. <laughs> and it was the people who stood behind Churchill, not the, not the establishment. Well, uh, that's not true, some of the establishment, but there was an awful lot of the establishment were appeasers and even admirers of Hitler, weren't they? But going back to this, I mean, we really need her. We need to get out on the 29th because, as Jacob Rees-Mogg said, it's going to be very dangerous. I mean, this is our democratic way of doing it. And if you deny people democracy, you're going for uh, extremism and violence, aren't you? Hello? Well, I'm going to take over there because we seem to have lost the line uh, to Nigel. I'm Ian Dale. I'm going to be, uh, well, we've got quite a show for you tonight. We've got three hours, as usual, at nine o'clock. We're going to be asking um, about the care system because the government...